Hello trainers, Professor Palm here, and welcome back to Summer Splash. I hope you've all been having a great summer. I really hope you're also trying to stay cool as well. Like I said, I'm giving you a bunch of water activities to do to try to beat the heat, but sometimes it's nice to get a tan in the summer. And hey, you should also be careful though, because it's also the start of hurricane season. However, I hope you've been enjoying all the water type Pokemon we've covered for Summer Splash. I have to say that, unfortunately, Summer Splash is coming to an end. So I thought that the greatest way to end Summer Splash, before we talk all about water type Pokemon, was to go all the way back to the beginning. That's right, we're going to talk about the very first water type Pokemon. What the? What are you guys doing here? I'm going to talk about the very first water type po Oh. <laughs> I remember this. In your video, I was talking about you guys, but then the fossil Pokemon came because they thought I was talking about them. But no, sorry guys. You already had your episode, and I'm talking about the very, very first Pokemon that were water types, not from the Pokedex. So yeah, I think you guys should just jet... I really apologize, my dear trainers. Little bit of a <laughs> mix-up that we got last time as well, but everything should be much better now. I was thinking that today we're going back to where it all began, the prehistoric time. That's right. Today, I become a paleontologist. I love studying fossils. So let's go back in the time machine, go back to the Stone Age, and say hello to our ancestors of the Water-type Pokémon. That's right, today we're going to talk about Ammonite, Amistar, Kabuto, and of course, Kabutops! When it comes to having the very first Water-type Pokémon, you can't go any farther than this. These Pokémon lived during the Stone Age. You know what else lived during the Stone Age? Reggie Rock himself lived during the Stone Age. It's highly possible that Reggie Rock encountered many of these Pokemon back in the day, but knowing that this is a rock type Pokemon, Reggie Rock may not have gone to where they were, as these Pokemon preferred to live in the water or around the water, as they felt that was their safest habitat. Even though these Pokemon look very powerful, they unfortunately had a lot of downsides that drove them to their extinction. However, some of them are still alive and avoided their extinction, and there are people that have even reported knowing that these Pokemon live in little nature preserves or in secret places that shielded them from time. But the ones that went extinct have recently been brought back. How, you may ask? Well, it's easy. There have been scientists that have created a fossil restoration machine so yeah, these are our ancestors, but let's also hope that someone plays it smart and doesn't make a theme park full of these prehistoric creatures. I'm looking at you, John Hammond, don't get any ideas. But one thing that's much different from the dinosaurs of Jurassic Park with these guys is the fact that almost all fossil Pokemon, these guys included, are mostly male, while getting a female fossil Pokemon is very, very rare. So, at least you got that without having to worry about them breeding. I think we owe Kabuto, Kabutops, Amistar, and Ammonite everything for what we have today. What do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. You see, these Pokemon are prehistoric, and they existed in the time when there were cavemen. So think about that! Cavemen and these Pokemon were hunting partners. It's also possible that they fought, but when they all realized they had a common enemy, they all banded together and became a powerful tribe. And I even think some of these Pokemon taught cavemen how to hunt. After all, when you look at some cave paintings, you see weird looking creatures. It's possible that these were the creatures that helped the cavemen. And the cavemen learned many things, like what do berries do? What berry does what? how to battle, how to use moves outside of battle, and most of all, how to trade and how to get even stronger with these Pokemon. These cavemen were the very first trainers who learned everything that we know today, and without any of these Pokemon, how would the world of Pokemon look? 
Since these Pokemon all came from the water, it's highly possible that they taught cavemen how to swim, and without them, none of us would even know how to swim. So, why don't we talk all about these incredible fossil Pokemon, but before we begin... I want to give a ginormous thank you to Tecranova for my shirt, The Water Turtle Within. This is one of my favorite starter Pokemon of all time, but I also thought that since we're talking about fossils and a lot of scientists see turtles as living creatures that survived the Stone Age, it would be the perfect shirt to wear. If you like this shirt, you can buy it off Etsy and you'll look great in it. Thank you so much, Tecranova, and I hope that other people buy these shirts from you. Please tell her Professor Palm sent you. Give her the business that she needs. And plus, you'll all look really good in those shirts. I know I feel good in these shirts. I feel powered up. Speaking of powered up, why don't we start with these incredible fossils? And let's start the right way. Let's start with the little mollusk itself, Ammonite. Ammonite, the spiral Pokemon, are extinct Pokemon, but they can be obtained and added to your party. How you have to do this is you have to find yourself a Helix Fossil. They can be found under the sea, in caves, or even if you decide to go mining and digging for fossils. So yeah, finding this Pokemon is very easy because all you have to do is restore it from the Helix Fossil. If you didn't know, Ammonite is based off of an extinct species of mollusk known as Ammonodia, otherwise known in a group as Ammonites. Ammonite's shell is very reminiscent of an ancient mollusk shell. Let's be honest, a lot of us have seen these shells at museums, but we also see them on the desks of archaeology professors and even paleontology professors. Ammonite are very shy Pokemon. The main reason why is these Pokemon were preyed upon by many prehistoric Pokemon. When this Pokemon senses danger or it feels threatened, it hides inside of its shell. This shell is very, very rough. However, it has been bitten and it can break. There are some scientists that have done records showing that this Pokemon has claw marks and even bite marks on its shell. The bite marks being from Archaeops and the slash marks being from Caracosta. Other than being its home as well as its shield it would hide behind, the shell served another purpose for Ammonite. You see, it was Ammonite's personal elevator. Using the air stored in its shell, Ammonite could float to the surface without any trouble. And if it got rid of all that air, it could sink to the bottom of the sea in just a second. So yeah, that little shell also served as an elevator. Scientists believe that this Pokemon in the prehistoric times swam in the primordial sea. That's right, the primordial sea, meaning that Kyogre was around and that Ammonite got to swim with Kyogre back in those days. Since Kyogre was the king of the ocean, it never really minded having some company swim with it. If you're wondering how this Pokemon swam with such stubby little arms and stubby little legs, the answer is pretty simple. You see, this Pokemon mainly twisted its ten tentacles all around, but most of the time it was more of a bottom feeder and would crawl on the seafloor. They feasted a lot on plankton. Ammonite are very harmless creatures, and they won't even hurt a fly. So yeah, not only are they shy, they're very harmless, and they have no ability to fight in combat. However, they do know how to roll their shells. That's right. Just like Cannon Bolt from Ben 10, these Pokemon tuck themselves into their shells and roll down the hills or wherever they need to go to. So yeah, they do have a bit of a secret weapon. Despite being able to do this, they cannot learn the move Rollout for some reason. But they also use water attacks to try to protect themselves. And being that they are not the strongest, they try anything they can to avoid battles and try to be peaceful creatures. For those of you who were very unaware, Matchop and Ammonite actually had the same cry until Generation 6. So yeah, if you have any of those old Gen 1 to Gen 5 games, put a Matchop and an Ammonite together and you'll notice that their cries are the exact same. Here's another nugget of information I'm very aware that a lot of people don't know. If you take the E out of Ammonite's name and reverse it, it becomes T. 
Tynamo. Yes, you heard me right. It becomes the little electric eel introduced in Gen 5. And that's kind of crazy to think of. Tynamo has no weakness and Ammonite has many weaknesses. Hmm, could these Pokemon be related to one another despite the typing? Or is this an eerie coincidence? Why don't you decide? Battling is always a lot of fun, but some of us like to be a pacifist and we prefer not to fight. Very similar to little Ammonite, who does not like to do that. And also, how can you look at this Pokemon and not think, aww, look at those big little eyes it has. Such a sweetie pie, it could never hurt a fly. But for those of you who really want to engage in combat, I think it's time we evolve our little spiral Pokemon into the bigger spiral Pokemon itself, Amastar. Amastar, the spiral Pokemon, is also based off of the extinct mollusk Ammonite, but it also has the marine species Nautilus mixed in. Also, if you say its name very slowly, Amastar, it kind of sounds like as if you're saying, I'm a star. While Ammonite were very shy creatures that always hid in their shells, Amastar were rarely found inside of their shells. These Pokemon really liked to stay outside of it and look around. They also used this method for a interesting way of hunting, you see. These Pokemon had a special way of hunting in the prehistoric times. They would hide in the sand underwater, and then when a Pokemon would swim by, Amistar would jump out and wrap its frontal tentacles all around its prey. Despite this Pokemon's small size, it had incredible strength underwater, and it would never let go. Amistar's sharp fangs is what made its prey surrender. You see, its fangs were so sharp it could crush rocks in just a single chomp. Also, these Pokemon feasted on ancient shelter and sucked out their insides. Wow, sad to see that poor little Bival Pokemon get eaten by this thing. In recent studies, scientists have learned that Amistar and the Pokemon Octillery are distant relatives. The reason is very simple, not just because of the tentacles, but also because of Octillery's rock head. Very similar to the body that hides inside of this shell. So yeah, if you really think about it, a lot of people see the shell as most of a head for Amistar. So I can pretty much see the similarities right there. But you should also know that the shell that Amistar has, it can also roll. And when it rolls, it can be very spiky, especially coming down the hills. Amistar's shell isn't just for show, you see. Scientists believe that because of the shell, it protected itself from predators, as this Pokemon was preyed upon by Archaeops and Caracosta, just like Ammonite. However, a lot of paleontologists think that this shell also played a major role into making this Pokemon go extinct. On land, the shell that Amistar had caused it to go extinct, the main reason being that it made it move very slowly, and since this Pokemon was no plant eater, it could not get Pokemon or even little plankton into its mouth in time, and since it moved so slowly, other Pokemon would stomp on it or even eat it while it was trying to move. It was also just as slow underwater, because when this Pokemon would crawl underwater, a lot of Caracosta would prey upon this Pokemon. And since Caracosta have shells of their own, they knew how to smash the shell and eat these little mollusks. In the end, because of this ginormous shell it had, it drove this Pokemon into extinction, which is rather sad thinking of how incredible this Pokemon was and that its shell played a major role in killing it. How upsetting that the only thing that protected it and was its own home is the thing that murdered it. If you're going to raise this Pokemon, I think the best thing that you could do is fashion a home for this Pokemon out of a floatstone. After all, the floatstone is very, very light, and because this Pokemon can use a lot of water attacks and it can jump very high because it could from the water, it could be a pretty tough force to take on with anyone else. So yeah, maybe think about fashioning a shell out of a floatstone in the future. 
While Ammonite might be very slow, and its shell also holds it back, sometimes slow and steady wins the race. And annoyingly, this Pokemon cannot learn the move Rollout, which is kind of ridiculous when you look at its shell. If you teach this Pokemon maybe to spin very fast, it could win you a victory. Annoyingly, it can't even learn Rapid Spin either. How on earth is a Pokemon that has a shell with spikes and can tuck itself into it unable to learn these moves? Honestly, it really beats me, but who knows? Maybe you could even teach it moves to use in a contest. Sometimes the oldest Pokemon have the most incredible skills that we don't even know about. Crazy to think that all this power comes within that little Helix fossil. Wow, who would have guessed that an ancient mollusk could be so powerful yet so slow at the very same time? But it also has a lot of interesting ways it hunts. And this Pokemon has a very cool history with Kyogre, especially that it swam in the primordial sea. However, I think it's time that we move on to the Dome Fossil. The Dome Fossil, for those of you who don't know, looks like a horseshoe crab fossil. And from that, we get Kabuto and Kabutops. One thing I have to say about Kabuto is I really like that this Pokemon looks kind of like a Jawa. You know, those creatures from the Star Wars universe with those brown coats and those glowing red eyes. Well... Why don't we stop wasting time and talk about these incredible ancient shellfish Pokemon. Kabuto, you're up first! Kabuto, the shellfish Pokemon, is like if you fused an extinct creature known as a trilobite and the living fossil creature of our time, the horseshoe crab. Kabuto lived about 30 million years ago on the beaches, and in all that time that they've been extinct to now, they haven't changed a bit. Kabuto protects itself with a very hard shell from predators like Archaeops, Aerodactyl, Caracosta, and Armaldo. The reason why this shell is so hard is because Kabuto molted every three days, making its shell harder and harder every time it molted. But that shell also had a downside too. Just like normal horseshoe crabs, when Kabuto fall over, they cannot flip over and they have way too stubby little feet to help them. Moving around doesn't really help them. All they do is just move from side to side, and it doesn't usually help this Pokemon. What they usually have to do is either wait for another Kabuto or even another Pokemon to come and help it, or they can just wait for the tide to come in. When speaking about Kabuto's shell, what most people don't know is that this Pokemon has four eyes, Yes, it has two red ones underneath and two on top. So this Pokemon can see four places at once. Isn't that incredible? Many scientists believe that Kabuto are extinct, but many trainers and paleontologists alike would disagree. After all, in the recent years, many Kabuto have been spotted in places, which has coined the nickname for this Pokemon, the Living Fossil which is very reminiscent of what the species it's based on is also called itself. That's right, horseshoe crabs themselves are called living fossils. I gotta say, looking at Kabuto from this angle kind of makes you think of a Jawa. You know, those little red-eyed creatures from Star Wars that wore the brown hoods? They're very, very cute creatures, and despite those giant red eyes, they're very, very shy. Back in the prehistoric times, some Kabuto were so scared of showing their faces because of predators, they just hated the sand for hours. Since they have four sets of eyes, the top eyes could often tell if anything was coming for them or not. In fact, these Pokemon spent so much time in the sand that a lot of scientists and paleontologists alike that have uncovered these fossils believe that these Pokemon never left that spot they were staying in and went extinct because of their own fear. Kabuto also bear a similarity to the species from another Nintendo-owned property, Metroid. The species I'm talking about are the Rippers. So yeah, maybe showing this Pokemon to Samus Aran is a bad idea because she'll try to blast it immediately. And thankfully, that may not work because Kabuto's shell is so hard that some people claim, with how many times this Pokemon changes its shell by molting, it's now bulletproof. 
The good thing about Kabuto and Rippers is that Kabuto are shy and very calm creatures, while Rippers are killing machines. But if you want to see what this thing looks like with speed as fast as a ninja, and you want to see this Pokemon when it's enraged, then why don't we evolve our little Kabuto into the ninja fossil itself? Kabutops! This Pokemon's blades are so terrifying, they would even drive Jack the Ripper to run away. Kabutops, the shellfish Pokemon, is also based on a Trilobite and a Horseshoe Crab for a fusion, but let's add a little Mantis thrown into the mix for its blades. If you didn't know, because of this Pokemon's slim build, Kabutops is an excellent swimmer. This Pokemon swims at speeds of roughly 30 miles per hour. For those of you who are curious how this Pokemon can move so fast, the answer is very simple. It has the ability to tuck in its limbs. Also, this Pokemon is very slim and it has very quick legs. So yeah, a slim body plus fast legs and a not heavy weight makes this Pokemon a speedboat. Be very careful of Kabutops' scythe-like arms because those blades slice anything they touch like butter. With these sharp claws, this ferocious Pokemon rips prey apart with no mercy. But the reason why you don't really see its mouth is because Kabutops prefer to suck its prey's body fluid, just like it's a vampire. When going underwater, Kabutops' back fins can be helpful for this Pokemon, especially for steering. They also act as a secondary armor for this Pokemon, while it also was preyed upon despite having weapons, it has a similarity to samurai armor, which keeps it very safe from teeth, claw, and even attacks that this Pokemon is thrown at. So yeah, this Pokemon is both a ninja and a samurai of the water. Pretty cool, huh? Charles Darwin would have been very proud of this Pokemon, because this Pokemon learned to adapt on land. That's right. If you look very carefully, this Pokemon's gills and legs changed over time. You see, this Pokemon was feared by Pokemon in the water, but then it learned to walk on land and even become a land creature, very similar to Charles Darwin's own theory of evolution and natural selection. So this would be the perfect Pokemon for him to teach people with. If you've never heard the rumors, there's a rumor going on that Genesect, the Paleozoic mythical Pokemon, is actually a Kabutops with armor given to it by Team Plasma, just like how Mewtwo was fitted with weapons by Team Rocket and Giovanni. If that's true, then wow, that is one deadly shellfish that has evolved into our era. The reason I say that is it's traded its blades for blasters. Hmm, so I guess you could see that a prehistoric creature became a futuristic fighting machine. Pretty impressive, I gotta say. Kabutops' blades also have the ability to never dull. In fact, even when this Pokemon is a fossil or skeleton, it still has very sharp blades. Some fans even believe that Kabutops is the ancestor of Scyther, which makes a lot of sense. Who knows, maybe Cleavor also belongs to the family, as well as Scizor and Mega Scizor. I really would love to know if that actually is the case. It is kind of interesting to see that a rock water type Pokemon later on became a bug flying type. Then that would really prove the evolution theory Charles Darwin proposed. Hmm, only time will tell though, sadly. But I think that this Pokemon can stand the test of time. All the fossil Pokemon, Kabuto, Ammonite, Amistar, and Kabutops all made their anime debut in the episode attack of the prehistoric Pokemon, they were all awakened from their ancient slumber by Team Rocket detonating a bomb in Grandpa Canyon, where Ash and his friends were looking for fossils. And yes, this was the episode that Ash got his Charmeleon to evolve into Charizard. So that's why I think a lot of us really remember this episode. Ammonite, Amistar, Kabuto, and Kabutops all have the same abilities. You see, they can either have the ability Swift Swim, which gives them extra speed in the rain, or they could have the ability Battle Armor, which prevents this Pokemon from being hit with critical hit moves. 
So yeah, since these Pokemon are water rock type, they have a major weakness to grass. So beware of grass type Pokemon. Paleontologists and scientists alike believe that back in the prehistoric times, these Pokemon were just pure water type, but because they were fossilized for so many years and restored, they gained a rock type because of the missing DNA that they used to put into their... Hmm. Very similar to that of what John Hammond did in Jurassic Park. There are so many fossil Pokemon, and for the very first fossils, I think these guys set the bar very high. I do have one major complaint about these Pokemon, and it's the fact that there is no paleontologist, not even an archaeologist in the world of Pokemon, in the games that is, that has ever used any of these Pokemon. I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that we don't have a paleontologist gym leader or even a paleontologist Elite Four member. I guess it could also work for archaeology too, but when we're talking more about fossils, paleontology works better. I don't know, would you guys think that having a paleontologist gym leader or Elite Four member would be fun? While I really do love Kabutops and Amistar's design, I am kind of surprised that these Pokemon did not achieve Mega Evolution while Aerodactyl did get a Mega Evolution in Pokemon X and Y. I'm not saying that they're bad designs whatsoever. It's possible that they couldn't think of a great design, but it does beg the question, why was Aerodactyl the one that achieved Mega Evolution while these two couldn't receive another one? I'm pretty sure that they would have looked even cooler with a Mega Evolution, but again, I don't know what was going on when the artists were doing that. When it comes to the years that we've had fossil Pokemon, I think that every time they just get better and better, but I do believe that the very first fossil Pokemon set a very high standard. Yep, I really would go on record to say that Kabutops, Kabuto, Ammonite, and Amistar are the top tier fossil Pokemon, and I would never take out Aerodactyl as well. But we are talking about water type Pokemon. And I have to say, for the very first water type Pokemon, they are very incredible hunters. Having one on your team is very helpful. And I have to say, all these years later, they still have all that great skill they had back in time. So that's one thing that's pretty cool that all the memories and skill that they've had never leave them. Imagine you're a caveman and the elder of the village comes to you with both of these Pokemon, and you have to take one of them with you, who would you choose? Well, there is no wrong choice. After all, they're both water Pokemon, and they can really help you getting water, and they can even help you guys hunt. Now that we're in the future, and we still can have these Pokemon, there's one good thing you could always say about them. These Pokemon were our friends back in the prehistoric times, and they still are now. Who's your favorite fossil Pokemon? I really want to know. Do you like the old school fossils, these guys, as well as Aerodactyl? Or do you like the new stuff that Pokemon has made? Are you interested in finding out what the next fossils will be in the upcoming Scarlet and Violet games? If you ask me, I really hope we get another fossil fusion. That was a lot of fun. If you want me to talk about that sometime, I definitely would be happy to because I love fossil Pokemon. Or if you want me to talk about fossil Pokemon from other generations, please let me know. I hope that you guys have been enjoying the videos of Summer Splash. It's unfortunately coming to an end on Saturday. So yeah, we're going to go off with a big one. But I want to say now, if you liked what you saw, please leave a like. If you have an idea that you want to get turned into a video, or you wish to answer any of the questions I said, please comment. And as always, if you liked what you saw and you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. If any of your friends are interested in this stuff, please share my videos. I really want to entertain all of you, and I'm glad that you watch. Summer Splash is coming to its end. Thanks for watching. Palm out.